I also heard you once say, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Europeans are economic terrorists, mm -hmm. master liars, and plagiarists who have never created a civilization <coughs> based on the rules of civilization, right? Mm -hmm. uh, before giving us the historical evidence for this claim, can you explain to the viewers what are the rules or characteristics of a civilization? The base, most basic characteristic of civilization is respect for human life, respect for nature, respect for ecology, you know, respect for cosmology. Because all of these things work together. Like say, you and I, we want to plant some barley. Well, we can't just plant the barley any time of the year. You have to plant the barley a certain time of year, so you must master the, the cosmology to know where the stars are, where the moon is, where the sun is, at the time that's appropriate for planting barley. I've got to also know in my environment, what is the weather condition? Is it warm, is it cold, is it rainy, is it dry? Which is the best time of year? So that's a part of civilizing is the science of managing and respecting ecology and cosmology. This is the most fundamental. Then respecting human life, that you can't just kill people to take things. That you need to build human relationship to learn how to share things. That's most fundamental in civilization. And that you can begin to build the systems that allow for you to feed, clothe, and shelter your population without warfare, murder, or mayhem, or genocide, as we've seen Europe do for millennia. Casar Sancta Urbis Roma Augustus, noum legatum ad Germania Midi. Senatorem Publium Quintilium Warum. Verstehst du, was er sagt? Nein. <lacht> Futuete. Velu este porro nil tenent. Ustak, Roma tributa vostra non amplius remissuras. Sie gestern versagt er. Die Römer wollen abgaben. Varus exigit ab omni tribu pretium viceum baum. Well, quinquagenum ponderum frumenti centenari. Sie wollen Vieh und Getreide. Seid ihr blind? Sieht es hier aus, als ob es hier was zu holen gibt? Quid? Bikita, Roma. Er sagt, du sollst es wiederholen. Patium Wobis est tridu! No. And so, when we think of civilization, you think of people who are living according to an order. They've studied the laws of nature. They've studied the laws of cosmology, ecology. They've turned those into their artificial social laws and they live according to those laws that give them harmony and balance. I was saying, yeah, listening to you, just to sum it up, civilization is man mimicking the universe, the universe, how it's able to work together. Yes. That's like the best definition. That's sacred science. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, so for the second part, right, uh, why do you say Europeans never created a civilization? Show me one. <laughs> That's the only question I've had. Show me a European civilization. Rome was not a civilization. Greece was not a civilization. You don't know a day in the history of Greece where there wasn't a war. You don't know a day in the history of Rome and there wasn't a war. Those are not civilization. Those are death cults, war culture. Hold!
They're not building anything. They're stealing from other people, borrowing from other people, and still carrying on this anti-human, anti-nature behavior of murdering, stealing, to conquer and appropriate something that belonged to someone else that you could have gotten by just shaking the hands and making a deal. Now, Egyptians made a journey across the Atlantic. How did they do that? Why did they do that? How do we know that they, do it? they did it? Listen carefully. Do not confuse modern Egypt with ancient Egypt. These are two totally different worlds. But you see, Egypt was so rich. The Africans were so extraordinary, and they were not superior people. You don't have inferior and superior people. This is what makes you superior and inferior. A certain vision of the world, a certain vision of yourself. Many of us have been destroyed, reduced, because we've been made to accept other people's vision of us. <laughs> Look why Egypt is no longer Egyptian. There was another people who built the pyramids. The Syrians attacked in 654 BC. The Persians attacked in 550 BC. The Greeks attacked in 320 BC. The Romans attacked just before and after Christ. The Arabs attacked 638 to 640 AD. That is why Egypt is no longer Egyptian. They have nothing to do with the building of the pyramids. Are the Hermetics at all? No. Ah, are you interested? In, yes. Have you heard about them at all? Sure. This thing? You, we, Please. Uh, have you heard of a book called The Kabbalion? No. Well, this should be right up your street. The Hermetics were Egyptians. It's what the free, where the Freemasons came from, and the alchemists, and the, and the people in the Middle Ages who preserved the culture. Brothers of the East was a secret order formed in Greece that eventually set up their headquarters in Istanbul. They practiced alchemy, they studied sacred geometry, they performed rites and rituals incorporating astrology, astronomy, music, and mathematics. So when Hugh de Paines, a French nobleman, met the Brothers of the East, he was excited. De Paines was technically Catholic as most of Europe was, but he had family members who were of the Sufi Islamic faith which is the more mystical side of Islam. The Paines had been told of this secret group that possessed and was protecting ancient knowledge. He wanted to meet this group and see for himself. At this time in history, Europe was in chaos. Various kingdoms were rising and falling and warring with each other. In the East, Muslims and Christians were clashing. The world was tearing itself apart, yet the brothers of the East possessed a peaceful wisdom they weren't concerned with modern politics. The brothers had a purpose that was much more important. Once mutual trust was established, the brothers of the East told the European visitors their story. Well, not their story, the story. It was the story of an ancient civilization that thrived thousands of years ago. The people were highly spiritual and highly advanced. It was a civilization that was free of poverty. Wealth was meaningless. They devised methods of growing crops so that every citizen was fed. They could control the weather. Droughts and famine were impossible. To Hugh de Paines, this civilization had abilities that sounded like miracles or like sorcery. They could communicate over long distances instantly somehow. 
They had a way of levitating objects, no matter how large or how heavy. They had medicine that could cure any illness, allowing people to live very long lives. War didn't exist. There was such an abundance of resources that anyone can have whatever they wanted. And what these people wanted most was to pursue their own spirituality. And then they were gone. How, de Paines asked, could a civilization this powerful, who seemed to be able to control nature itself, be suddenly wiped out? The Brothers of the East said in a single day the ground shook, and volcanoes emerged and erupted. Then a giant flood swept over the earth and destroyed everything. Ah, I know where this is going. It was then that Hugh de Paines and his eight knights learned of Atlantis. Yeah. Hugh Paines and his fellow knights were riveted by the story. De Paines was a nobleman, a count in fact. He was the Count of Champagne. Le Mouet Champagne. Oh, pardon my French. De Paines was an educated man. He knew about Plato and his stories of the island of Atlantis. He thought they were just stories. The brothers said Plato was mostly correct. But Atlantis wasn't just a city, or even just an island. It was a civilization that spanned the globe. And each city was connected using transportation technology that, again, sounded like magic. The story became almost overwhelming. Almost. The brothers said that ancient relics of Atlantis still exist. And they still possess their power. The power to travel great distances. The power of communication. The power to heal. Perhaps even the secret to immortality. If ever discovered, these artifacts would be the most powerful and dangerous devices on Earth. De Paine said that any kingdom, any country, any religion would kill to have access to this power. The Brothers of the East agreed. The technology of Atlantis could not fall into the wrong hands. So Hugh de Paine's was offered an assignment. Find the ancient artifacts and bring them back to Europe for safekeeping. That's it. Look at that thing. Bro. Are you fucking kidding me? The reshot structure. That's it. The reshot structure. I mean, are you fucking kidding me? Like if you go 3D, you can see the... Now imagine if that was this massive city of concentric circles and walls and a thriving population, and then it gets hit with this water. You can see the water erosion all over the place. The whole thing looks like it's washed out. See? Yeah. It looks like it was washed out because it was right. And that's salt, I believe. But that's yes, what there's makes salt there. That's the other thing. Between this and the Garden of Eden locations, like these are the two. These are two of the great landmarks in uh, human history. Where's the Garden of Eden? Well, when you read the stories, right, the, the thing that strikes you is that it's so specific. Like, it says things in talking about the Garden of Eden that, wait a minute, if I can't find what you're talking about, this isn't even real. You see what I'm saying? Right. Like, like, where the Garden of Eden was, there's, I think, four rivers that come from it. And then it names two of them, like, I don't want to be specific because at least he's going to bring it up. But it's like the Nile and the Euphrates, right? Right. So you know two of them. And it's saying, you know, where the four meet, this is where it is. And, um, yeah, my whole life I was like, <clears throat> This, this is really weird because at one period of time we're thinking no flood happens. There's so many things that have lined up from these great religious books yeah. to we, where we can see that, no, something happened here. Like, something happened, and these are stories of people telling stories that have been told to them for about a thousand years. But this is why, right? Yeah. This is because why they were told. And that's what yeah. you, that's the difference between those of us that, um, want to know the world's mysteries and conspiracy theorists. Like, right. there's nothing to a cons 
conspiracy theorists because you're not producing what you're using. But these world mysteries, like, um, that's harder to do. A, a lie is not something that people are going to repeat for generations on generations. It's being repeated like that because people have reason to believe it to be true. And, and um, as you go through history, you see that um, those are the stories that we still talk about, but they're still valid. Like the, there were writings that the African Dogon tribe is mm -hmm. like, right. like, like they're, from like the Sirius star the, system. Like they're saying very specific yeah. things, and for hundreds of years we're going. You guys are idiots. You don't know what you're talking about, right? right. Like somebody will have a fake star story. Right. You see? Right. And now we get to the point where we can actually see what they were talking what about. What if we find out that we're aliens? That we were just dropped off here a long ass time. And the Adam and Eve story is the, the story of the place where they created us. I'm sure we're the only people in the universe that think like that. You think so? Why do you think that? Um, no, no portion of humankind's story differs from that. It's all creation story. Like, if you go, that's why NASA and Space Force are not more forthcoming, because the further you get in space, the more obvious shit is. Like, once you're up there and you're looking down this shit doesn't look like there is no god it looks like you're in the middle of somebody's workshop and they just showed you every single way that every star can be made every single way a planet can be made every way that a black hole can be a galaxy a universe and then showed you the best of the best <laughs> <laughs> It's the spot. Hugh and the other eight men immediately agreed and formed a secret fellowship. But where do they start looking? The brothers said they'll find artifacts under the location of what used to be King Solomon's temple, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The Knights would have to act quickly. The Holy Land was a dangerous place. Jerusalem was taken by Christian crusaders in 1099, but who knows how long they can hold it. And there was another problem. It wasn't just the Knights that knew about the artifacts. Groups of Christians, Jews, Muslims, they were searching too. So when the Knights arrived in the Holy Land in 1120, they set up their headquarters where Solomon's Temple once stood. They officially became known as Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, the Knights Templar. And the Knights played the role of courageous warrior monks, protecting Christians making the long pilgrimage to the Holy Land. But while some Knights Templar guarded Jerusalem, other Knights were digging beneath it. Day and night they dug, until one day they struck gold, literally. The Brothers of the East were right. They promised the Knights Templar that if they dug under the Temple Mount, they would find artifacts that once belonged to the great civilization of Atlantis. The Knights found a large box made of acacia wood and gold. There was no question they had found the legendary Ark of the Covenant. And then they found five more. Year after year, the Knights Templar pulled treasures from beneath Jerusalem. They found the Spear of Destiny, the Holy Grail, the Emerald Tablet, and pages and pages of ancient esoteric wisdom. They learned there were 10 arcs, though they only found six. The arcs were used in conjunction with pyramids around the world to create limitless energy. This was similar to what Nikola Tesla attempted at Wardenclyffe Tower. If you want to learn how this technology worked, we have an episode that explains scientifically how the Great Pyramid of Giza could have been a power generator. Pyramid link below. Within the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid is a stone box. Mainstream Egyptology says this box is a sarcophagus to store a mummy, but no mummy was ever found there. And the dimensions of the box are kind of small for a human body, but the box is the perfect size to store one of the arcs. 
The Knights Templar discovered that the pyramids were built for one specific purpose, to store the arcs. And the arcs, they were built to store mana. In the Bible, mana was a food source that appeared to the Israelites in the desert. It's described as fine flakes that look like frost on the ground. But according to Templar tradition, the Israelites and the Atlanteans before them extracted mana from plant and animal matter and turned it into a monoatomic white powder. This white powder provides energy. A white powder that provides energy? Ah, New York in the 80s was wild, eh? Uh, you're thinking about something else. Ah. The mana acted as an electrical superconductor and powered the arcs inside the pyramids. The arcs generated unlimited energy for the thriving civilization. They learned these alchemical secrets from none other than the Emerald Tablet. Emerald Tablet, link below. The Emerald Tablet gave detailed instructions on extracting mana from animal bones. The mana could then be used for energy or even for healing illness. Hey, uh, didn't the Emerald Tablet also tell you how to become a mortal by making the uh, Philosopher's Stone? Yep. From eating pee? Yes. Eating lots of pee? Yes. Uh, immortality sounds gross. It does, but if you want to be immortal... Ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Nope. Even if lunch is pee. That's enough. Some of these ancient texts even talked about creating mana from gold. When mana was extracted from gold, it could be used to make objects lighter for levitation. Now, think about it. The Ark is a box almost four feet long and three feet wide. It's made of gold. Gold is heavy. The Ark of the Covenant also contain the Ten Commandments, which were carved into stone tablets. Stone is heavy. Just the gold would have weighed almost a thousand pounds. That doesn't include the weight of the stone or the acacia wood. Yet it only took four men to carry it. By the way, the men who carried the Ark were Levites. Levite. Levitation. I get a covenant, link below. The Knights Templar also found very old texts that even predated the civilization of Atlantis. These documents spoke of a non-human race that enslaved humanity thousands of years ago to mine gold. Anunnaki! Yahtzee. The Anunnaki come up a lot on this channel, and I promise I'll do a full episode on them, but here's the short version. The Anunnaki were gods worshiped by the ancient Sumerians, but they were actually aliens from a planet beyond Neptune called Nibiru. The Anunnaki arrived on Earth about 450,000 years ago, searching for resources, specifically gold. They were trying to solve an atmospheric crisis on their planet. Now, finding gold in abundance, they settled on Earth and established mining operations. Eventually, the Anunnaki created a labor force by genetically modifying early human ancestors, accelerating the evolution of Homo sapiens. We need this episode, Chief. I know, we'll do it, I promise. Yeah, 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 your promises and 60 bucks are worth about uh, one night's worth of mana. Okay. So, the Templars knew about the Anunnaki and how they converted gold into a powder used for healing, levitation, and generating electricity. And it wasn't just the Atlanteans and Israelites that knew about mana. Sumerian texts spoke of an alchemical science called Graal, which you can't help but notice is similar to the word Grail. The Sumerians used a substance called Shimana that was used to help the Anunnaki gods power their flying craft. In Vedic, Hindu, and Jain texts, this substance was called Vimana, which again was used to power flying crafts. Polynesian cultures believe mana is a force of nature anyone can extract. Buddhists call it mani. Though the words vary slightly in all these cultures, the definition and use are the same. Mana is a potent substance that allows humanity to tap into something very powerful in nature. And by the way, the Templar Cross, you can find that carved everywhere and every time civilization existed. The cross is all over ancient Egypt. And you can even see the cross carved on the ancient Sumerian depictions of the Anunnaki. Templar legend says this was actually the symbol of Atlantis. After Atlantis was destroyed in the Great Flood... Of the Younger Dryas. Yep. The Templar legend of Atlantis and the Great Flood is exactly like every other flood myth we find in every culture around the world. After the Flood, a few survivors restarted civilization with knowledge from Atlantis. The cross was carved in their honor. But not everything the Knights found was Atlantean. Some artifacts were from just a thousand years before, during the time of Jesus. 
There were ancient texts that confirmed a lot of what was said in the Bible, but some texts contradicted the Bible. There was no way the Knights could let the church find out what they discovered. The Catholic Church was growing more powerful every year. If the truth came out, it could shake the very foundation of the faith, and the Knights Templar would be destroyed. Besides, much of the Knights' funding came from the church. But no historical document compared to the shock of what they discovered next. Uh, in order for us to be able to do these things. Yeah. Like if you can hook a battery up to an octopus and make it go like this, you're halfway there. Yeah. Why? Because this this is a this is a machine that mm -hmm. we have. It's a biological here. machine, right? And once yeah. you understand it, you understand it. Yeah. And you yeah. can fuck with that machine. You could juice it up. You could fucking get it stronger. Get it smarter. This you is, do a lot of things with that machine. This is what the Anunnaki said. Yeah. This is how you know that these are not made up things from people's imagination, because everything is too factual. Like like this necklace, right? Right. People online were like, "Yeah, is that Buddhist or that's uh, this or that?" It, it's none of that. Like. Like I just try to find the answers to things. So I, is that I, a ship wheel? I designed this because this is that thing that you see that all the Anunnaki guys that have that look oh. like a Ritz watch, and they always have it, and you're always trying to see what that is. Yeah, what is that? It is a time and it's a compass. If you if you were to read like thousands of books about people that knew a bunch of shit like you f start finding out that it's not really about knowing anything it's about where to go to get the information you know what i mean yeah um so like when we look at all the ruins all around the world like we're not seeing ruins of colleges and universities and all of that we're seeing temples and synagogues and churches and but people don't understand that that's where that information was coming from for that period of time. When we went to these temples, they weren't in there singing and reading from a book. They were in there being taught things that they were able to go put into practice. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they were being taught our agriculture. You know what I mean? Like they were being taught. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. But they had some very bizarre knowledge too. They had a detailed knowledge of cosmology. They they, Joe, they had a really detailed knowledge of our solar system. One hundred percent of the writings across the world, whoever said anything about space or the universe or what was out there, why were all of them correct, Joe? It's not even possible. Like. <laughs> Mm. How did they know that Mars was the red planet and why was it a worldwide fact? Right. Planetarily, that Saturn had rings, like, yeah. based upon what information? Because nobody worldwide is disagreeing. Nobody's like, oh, I thought of this or I, it came to me in a dream. Nobody's saying that anywhere in anybody's civilization. Everybody's civilization says this information came from the people that came from there. Yeah. There's, like, there are no coincidences. <laughs> to believe in the Big Bang, you would have to believe that that had happened several times mm -hmm. throughout history, just because that's what we've seen from everything that's right. been created. We don't see one individual unique thing that exists and is responsible for all things, except the Big Bang. That was what Terrence McKenna always said. There's too much thought that went into certain things, like the fact that um, you can study all the butterflies and not one of them has a sense of humor. <laughs> you know what I mean? But me yeah. and you do. And yeah. like it goes for all humans, if, mm -hmm. if universally, if we see somebody trip and fall, we yeah. all laugh no yeah. matter what our back. Like there are certain, um, yeah, like like there's that. I, I'm trying to think of what the reasons are to not believe, but I can't remember what they are because it it doesn't 
it doesn't line up with anything like um and and we would have had to have gone in space and there'd be no other planets just this one just that's it for this story to make sense universally like we we're at a terrible time in history to say oh we don't believe in people from outer space when we can go to outer space like it's <laughs> it's almost asinine to try to make both of those make sense and to think that there's um our sun is not the biggest sun right not even close but it's the biggest sun we ever gonna see yeah. right so it's the biggest fucking sun right but the truth is no it's way bigger like Right, like that a uh, thought went into picking this particular sun for this planet and the moon and the positioning of much as if you were building a house, like you would put particulars in like Kid Rock yeah. like Kid Rock to make sure that throughout the time period of history you put a stamp and a mark on it right right yeah. that's why if you were extraterrestrial let's say and you were going to build one building on this planet it would be the pyramid on the pyramid. like most people don't even understand that there was a whole outer covering on that thing and gold cap mm -hmm. that gold the top. Cap, like it, it was a, yeah. it, it was a planetary Monument. Yeah. Right. You might be right. It makes more sense than the idea that these people pushed those things into place and then got them hundreds of miles out of the mountain with ropes. Shut the fuck up. Throughout history, we have not done things that did not profit us. And I'm, and not 150 years from now. Right. Now. Right. Now, all through, always. All through history. Right. So to be thinking that this particular civilization, oh, you know what we all care about? When he going to die. Let's, <laughs> we all, <laughs> I dedicate my life to when he going to die. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to die while I. Yeah. No, history doesn't say that in any way. It's also the sheer mass. 3,200,000 stones in the Great Pyramid. That is so much mass. All of the um, wonders of the world are truly that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of them too, man. The wild shit that they're digging out of Turkey is nuts too. That's the Gobekli Tepe place where they found... 12,000 year old structures back at the time when they thought people were just using sticks and stones and hunter gatherers. No, 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 they had because stone. the whole time they were saying that mm -hmm. it was there. Yep, but understand these are the things worthy of a war, just so you know. Worthy of a war, yeah, you see what I'm saying? All throughout history, mm -hmm. like you know what I mean? Yeah, that's the only. Um, thing a rational person can take from Hitler's story is being able to see um, what if you had unlimited resource and ability to just follow global rabbit holes. You find out that m most stuff that is labeled BS is not BS. BS is very hard to come by. Well, the Hitler thing is real weird because the Nazis are really into the occult. At some point in the information process, that was required. So. It was required to be into the occult. Um, so, so in like the world of medicine, like certain things before they had a label of being toxic, you just knew don't touch it. Like, you know what I mean? You didn't know what it was good for, but, um, those occultists were the keepers of things that did work, not things that did not work. Right. So, um, <laughs> um, but uh, 
throughout history, that whole process of thinking, anything that could fall into the al- alchemy conversation was seen as occult-based. It, it, it meant um, doing something unnatural. Mm. So even like the blacksmith was considered a part of that world through most of history. Really? Because he had an unnatural relationship with elements. He Uh, was able to take this and turn it into things. Forge steel. Yeah. An ossuary, which is a collection of bones. This ossuary held the bones of a very famous religious family all buried together. The Knights found the bones of Mary Magdalene, John the Baptist, and Jesus himself. But they also found the bones of the children Mary had with both of them. To call what the Knights Templar discovered blasphemous would be a huge understatement. They discovered documents and artifacts that would literally destroy the church. They needed to keep these treasures safe from being destroyed. They needed to keep them from falling into the wrong hands, specifically the Pope's hands. Something you long believed to be true but realized wasn't. Um, Well, as one of the uh, main opponents of the Illuminati, I always wanted to know what information they had that we didn't. And I, I found out, I was always wondering how our God could have been so thrown off by a story of a tree and fruit. And then I found out that that's not the case at all. Adam was God's son, which means Eve was his daughter. And if they have sex, that ruins everything. And that's what happened. And that's a piece right there. The Templars knew that the existence of the bones of John, Jesus, and Mary Magdalene and their children would mean the end of the Catholic Church. But to rub salt in an already gaping wound, the Templars found something potentially even more threatening to the church, an alternate belief system. The Templars were Christian, but not in the strictest sense as most of Europe was, and more importantly, as their king and employers were. Spreading information contrary to the teachings of the Catholic Church was not only heresy, it was a death sentence. Remember, this was all happening at the time of the Crusades. Religions were at war. The Templars couldn't speak about their findings, but couldn't ignore them either. So instead, they hid them, they protected them, and studied them. Some ancient wisdom included blasphemous ideas like the divine feminine, reincarnation, heaven as a state of mind, and an innate connection to the Creator. The Knights maintained their appearance as devout Catholics. They had to. Their biggest patron was the Catholic Church. You don't bite the hand that feeds you, especially the most powerful hand on earth. But in secret, the Knights Templar were Christian Gnostics. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, meaning divine knowledge. Other cultures call this enlightenment. The basic premise is that spirituality can be found within without needing an outside institution. So no reason to have priests, monks, saviors, or churches at all. You didn't need them to find God. He's already within you. One of the earliest Templar documents mentions God-given rights. Now Americans use this phrase or something close to it in the Declaration of Independence. But that was in the 18th century. The idea of God-given rights during the time of the Templars meant excommunication or worse. Only the Roman Church could give someone rights. Any alternative was bad for business. And instead of worshiping Jesus, many Knights Templar idolized John the Baptist, who they believe initiated Jesus into Gnosticism in the Great Pyramid. To the Templars, Jesus represented a Christos, a universal consciousness anyone could access, similar to the Buddha. They learned that being born again didn't refer to baptism. It referred to reincarnation, which someone would literally be born again. With the bones of Jesus, sacred documents, and artifacts from an ancient civilization, the Templars had plenty of evidence to back up their beliefs. They wanted to share this knowledge, but it wasn't the right time. The church was too powerful, they would have to wait. They would wait until this knowledge could be shared with the entire world. 
Evidence of the Knights Templar can be found all over the world. After they disbanded, they were determined to keep their knowledge and traditions alive, so they created alias groups to avoid detection. In Scotland, they became Freemasons. Portugal, they were known as the Knights of Christ. In Germany, they created Rosicrucianism. There's also evidence of them in the early Americas. Watch the episode that we had about the pyramids. Link below. You'll remember that the Great Pyramid has eight sides, not four. To this day, Templars are initiated in the Great Pyramid, and they believe that Egypt was one of the main sources of wisdom for the original knights. And if you look, the number eight is everywhere in Templar symbolism and architecture. The Maltese cross has eight points and was worn by a medieval order of knights that were attacked by fire. Today, it's the symbol of many firefighters. Yes.